This video is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform perfect for all your website needs. So as some of you may or may not already know, I have been in London for the past few weeks to cover the 67th annual BFI London Film Festival. If you're wondering like why I would do that or why I sometimes mention London in my videos, it's because I went to university there, I just graduated, um, and I majored in film, so like the BFI was a big part of my experience the whole time I was there. I actually had press accreditation for this year's past BFI Flair Festival, which is like their LGBT festival, and so I decided to apply for press accreditation again for the main festival this year. I've attended before, but this was my first time doing press for this particular festival. I feel like kind of a hack and fraud and uh, someone who gamed the system because instead of being with like a publication, I just have this YouTube channel. But I think just having like even a pretty modest following on social media or like a blog or a YouTube channel can actually get you in pretty easily at a lot of places. So that's how I found myself back in this miserable, miserable country for most of the month of October. The London Film Festival has been around since 1957, and it's run by the BFI, the British Film Institute, which is Britain's largest kind of film and television institution. It's funded by the UK government and also by the National Lottery and also by Lloyd's Bank. Um, if you've seen a film at the BFI in the past couple years, you invariably will have seen this one Lloyd's Bank ad that played before every movie. Anyway, this year, all in all, I saw 34 films at the film festival, mostly through press and industry screenings, but I also saw a few public screenings. And I've been trying to figure out how I would end up covering uh, the festival. Like for BFI Flair last year, I just wrote an article summing up the best and the worst on my website. But for this, since it's a bigger festival, I thought I would do a real video about it. And my plan as of right now is I'm just going to go through my personal best and worst of the festival um, off the cuff, unscripted. So this might be a little more casual, a little more conversational than usual. You know, maybe a little more kooky and crazy and silly than usual. I'm also sick. I'm sick right now. I have a cold. I tested negative for COVID today, but I'm still sick. Um, so if I like sound or look crazy, that's why. You know how YouTubers are always like, sorry, I'm so sick, you guys. Sorry if I sound weird. I'm just sick right now. I'm so sick. But also before I talk about any films, I wanted to mention kind of the big elephant in the room around this stuff that I've mentioned on the channel several times before, which are the Hollywood strikes going on right now. Um, very luckily, in the last few weeks, the WGA actually did reach an agreement with AMPTP and their strike has ended. So that's really exciting, really good for them. It sounds like they got a lot of their demands met. But of course, SAG-AFTRA are still on strike, and the latest I've heard is that they've been like totally iced out, so for all we know, they might be on strike for a good while longer. So with that in mind, as I talk about these films, um, from what I've heard, like critics are still allowed to review films, and like journalists are still allowed to write about films. Um, but I feel like I'm kind of in this strange place as like an influencer critic. I don't really feel like either of those things, but that's technically what I am trying to be in this context at least. But the main thing is what we want to avoid is promoting struck films because um, that would be tantamount to crossing the picket line because that's one of the jobs that actors are supposed to perform. So I had a really stupid idea for this video and like you can tell me if it's stupid, um, but basically I thought it would be funny if, like, I just avoided talking about any struck films that I had a positive review of, and instead I only talk about struck films if I have a negative review of them. Like, I'm only gonna talk about struck films if I didn't like them. And my reasoning there is, like, if we're supposed to avoid promotion, I will not be doing anything that could be construed as promoting any struck films. I'm only going to do the opposite of promoting struck films. I'm going to demote struck films. AMPTP, you're not getting any free good press. You're only getting free bad press. Anyway, let's get into it. So number one, I would have to say probably my highlight of the entire festival was the film Monster. This is a Japanese film. It's the latest from Hirokazu Koreeda. He is uh, known for directing Shoplifters, Broker, Afterlife, um, and plenty of other films. Shoplifters famously won the Palme d'Or at Cannes a couple years ago, so uh, Koreeda is really a big name on the international stage at this point. 
So Monster actually won Best Screenplay at Cannes this year, and it really deserves that. Um, it's actually one of the first in years that uh, Koreeda has not written himself. It's by a different screenwriter. It's kind of a Rashomon plot in the sense that you see this same sequence of events, same story from a variety of perspectives of different characters in the story. But it actually kind of subverts that in that instead of like seeing the same story through the eyes of these different people who all have their different biases and all kind of tell the story differently, it's more like presented as if each version of the story is still the objective facts of what happened, but like it just has the natural subjectivity of real life where like when we only see one side of a story we're only going to understand certain things about it. So I found that really interesting that like instead of the characters lying about what they've seen it's like no they saw what they saw but just you know you can only ever see so much of the full picture. The initial premise is basically that this young single mother notices that her 11 year old son is starting to act differently, act a little strange, and so she goes to his school to try to get to the bottom of it, and it's just never quite what you think it's going to be. It constantly keeps you guessing, and I just was so engaged throughout. Koreeda has this really interesting way of kind of building dread like a sense of dread within the story, you're just somehow always expecting the worst, even if that's not necessarily what always ends up happening. So this is just like the number one film I would recommend from this festival. Like if you like movies, you should watch it. Another great film I watched was The Taste of Things. Uh, the original French title as I saw it on the BFI website was The Pot au Feu, but now all the sources I can find online say that the French title is La Passion de Dodin Buffon, which I believe is the title of the book it's based on, so now I don't really know what to believe. But this channel is no stranger to randomly changing titles, so I'll just call it The Taste of Things. This is a French film by Tran An Hung, which I hope I'm pronouncing sort of close to how it's supposed to be pronounced. Hung is a Vietnamese French filmmaker. I've heard of his film The Scent of Green Papaya, but I've never watched it. The Taste of Things takes place in the late 19th century in France, and it follows this really famous celebrated chef and the kind of loyal cook that works with him, who's played by Juliette Binoche. And I just thought it was like sublime. It was beautiful to watch. I went into this press screening because uh, I had just read the description and it kind of sounded like one of those pleasant French movies about food that would have a lot of beautiful food footage in it. And it was, that was kind of exactly what it was. This is just like, if you, if you love those fancy cooking shows and you love just watching beautiful, intricate food get prepared, then you should watch this movie because it has that um, and it's presented beautifully, like beautiful cinematography, beautiful direction. It's kind of bittersweet. I just loved it. I thought it was a wonderful experience. Okay, next on my list is The Sweet East. The Sweet East is an American film by Sean Price Williams, who I believe was a cinematographer before this film. I think this is his directorial debut. And this film is not struck. I found out it was actually one of the films on the list from SAG that was given like an interim agreement. And it's definitely very independent, so I think that's probably why. The Sweet East is just like a crazy, crazy movie, and it's very, very funny. One of the funniest ones I've seen at the festival. It's kind of this episodic odyssey of a movie about this girl who is on a school trip to Washington DC and ends up getting separated from her group and kind of just going on this journey throughout the US and meeting all these weird various members of, of subcultures and just having this insane experience. The inciting incident of this movie is that the girl is with her class at like a pizza parlor, you know, it's like one of those nights on a school trip when they let you go out and do something fun. She's at the pizza parlor, she goes into the bathroom, and you hear like gunshots, and you're like, oh god, there's this pizza place is getting shot up, but you like cut to the gunman, and I, there's no other way to describe this. Pizza gate happens. The gunman like goes up to the owner of the pizza place and he's like, I know you have kids in the basement. And that really set the tone, honestly, for like the way that the entire movie addressed like the American experience. Um, one of the things I loved about it so much is that it is like an American movie. And I feel like it's one of the first films I've seen that really feels like it kind of understands like the absurdity of the present moment in America. And then on top of that, and, and I mentioned this in my Letterboxd review of this movie, 
like, I, I feel like there's been a lot made of kind of Gen Z cinema, you know, all of these movies have been named as like, oh, this is one of the first Gen Z movies. But this was the first film I've seen that like really felt resonant to me as like a young person in America. The film is so, so funny. And it all feels like it comes from this place of genuine intelligence, which I really appreciated about it. Like it has characters go off on these kind of philosophical diatribes. And I feel like that can be very annoying in movies if done incorrectly, or if it comes from kind of a pretentious place or a place of people who think they know a lot and don't actually know that much. But it was actually working very well here because like the dialogue is actually so smart and so funny. There are also some wild casting choices in this movie. Like you'll be watching it and you'll be like, oh, that person? I didn't think they would be here. I'm sorry, I'm not an actress. No, 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 that's okay. That's okay because the best actress is just a woman who says yes. And the story just ends up going in some crazy directions. I feel like it's probably not for everyone. It's very kind of frenetic and, and grungy and weird, but I really enjoyed it. I thought it was really hilarious. It'll probably be on streaming at some point. It's being distributed by the same company that did Shiva Baby, so I wouldn't be surprised if it ends up on like Hulu or something. So when it does, you should watch it. The last best film I want to talk about is a movie called Late Night with the Devil. This is an Australian film directed by Cameron and Colin Cairns. Carnes? I don't know. I assume they're brothers. Good for them. Late Night with the Devil is a really fun little horror movie in the style of like a 1970s late night talk show broadcast where it's Halloween night and they've got all these kind of spooky guests like a medium and a woman who works with a girl who claims to be like possessed by a demon. And, you know, they, they start interviewing these people and, of course, things go horribly wrong and it turns into a horror show. If anything, I think this is like the perfect watch in your house on Halloween night kind of movie. It's just very fun, kind of campy, some great practical effects. If anything, like usually I think that the best way to watch a movie is in the theater. If anything, I feel like this one would be kind of improved by watching on your TV at home because that kind of improves the illusion that it's this real TV broadcast that really happened. If you have one of those like vintage TVs that you could put this on, you should definitely do that. That would be very atmospheric. And now, without further ado, let's get into the worst. This is going to be, for some people probably, including myself, the more fun part of this video. Sometimes I get comments from people that are like, why don't you talk about X good movie? And I'm like, well, I don't really like talking about good movies. It's not that fun to me. There's a lot more to chew on if I have issues with something, you know what I mean? And boy, do the following films have issues. But before we get into the worst movies, I'd like to tell you once again about today's sponsor, Squarespace. You already know Squarespace has been around on the channel for a while now, and they've really helped me out a lot in this whole mission to go to London to cover this festival. Of course, their website building tools are really unmatched. They're so flexible and customizable for whatever your needs might be. I'm always talking about how much I love their blog features. Um, last year, when I was covering the BFI Flare Festival, I, of course, posted some of my reviews on my blog, and I'm thinking of maybe doing some other write-ups for this year's festival, like if I wanted to go more in-depth on some of these films. And I also think Squarespace could be a great tool for filmmakers. It, of course, lets you host video, so if you wanted to keep your films someplace other than like a YouTube or a Vimeo, uh, Squarespace could be a great option for that. Like I mentioned earlier, it's really not that hard to get press accreditation at some of these festivals as long as you like run a blog or a self-published publication of some sort or make videos. And of course, Squarespace is a great place to host any of that type of content. And, you know, if you're trying to build an audience, they let you view your analytics and kind of manage those things really easily. If you're hosting videos on Squarespace, you can even, like, sell access to member areas. So if you didn't want your film to be, like, fully publicly released for free, you could sort of distribute it in that sense and, like, make money off of your work. Maybe you want to sell posters of the amazing movie you just made. You can do that on Squarespace. I'm a big fan of Squarespace and their products, and if you want to try it, you can go to squarespace.com for a free trial, and then when you're ready to launch, you can go to squarespace.com slash Mulcahy for 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thank you again, Squarespace, for sponsoring this video. Now back to the negativity. Next up is Horde. 
Horde is a special movie in the sense that this was by far my least favorite thing I saw at the festival. Probably one of my least favorite movies I've ever seen in my life. Horde is a British film. It is the directorial debut of its director, Luna Carmoon. And frankly, I think Luna Carmoon should be in jail. I think I should be entitled to financial compensation for having had to sit through this movie. I think whoever made this should is going to hell. It's hard to even describe what is so bad about Horde. Like, I'm gonna tell you the premise and you'll probably not understand why it's so bad, but I'm gonna try and make you understand. So the film starts uh, on this story of a mother and daughter. It's like this woman who is a hoarder and uh, she lives with her young daughter, maybe like six or seven, and they have a really nice relationship, but the mother is a hoarder and sometimes that kind of ruins things for them or, you know, makes, makes the girl's life more difficult. And then the mother gets in an accident where like some of her hoarded stuff falls on top of her and, you know, the ambulance comes and the girl gets taken into foster care. So then we kind of fast forward in time to when the girl is graduating from school. She's like in her late teens and she's still living with the same foster mother that she was first dropped off with. And kind of the inciting incident, I guess, is that she hears that uh, a man is going to be coming to stay with them who is one of her foster mother's uh, other foster children that she used to care for. That man is played by Joseph Quinn, uh, that guy from Stranger Things, as most Americans know him. And his character is supposed to be, like, older than the main character. She's, like, maybe 17, and they mention that he is almost 30. And then the other inciting incident is that uh, the girl gets a package delivered, and it's her mother's ashes. And she's like, well, that's kind of late. You know, my mom died like 10 years ago. And they say, no, we only do recent cremations. So your mom must have died a few weeks ago. And the daughter's like, oh, I guess like, <laughs> you know, she thought her mother died like when she was a kid, when that accident happened. And actually, I guess her mother has been alive all this time and didn't contact her. Um, you might be wondering, like, you know, where does that go in the movie? Nowhere. It doesn't go anywhere. It's uh, like, <laughs> yes, the movie is like about grief and about the daughter dealing with that. But also that whole thing of like her mom having actually been alive all this time and not contacted her, that never, like, it never explored at all. So the ensuing events are like this girl starting to form this weird relationship with the guy, Joseph Quinn. Um kind of this animalistic, like, whatever, like, erotic, also kind of nasty relationship, where also she, in in dealing with the grief of her mother, starts to kind of hoard herself, like, starts to fall into those patterns, starts collecting garbage, whatever. And again, it's hard to explain quite what goes wrong in this movie, but you have to believe me when I say that it is everything. This has to be the most aggressively unpleasant movie I have ever watched. And like, don't get me wrong, I can deal with movies that are like unpleasant on purpose, that are maybe gross, disturbing, nasty. You know, I've seen movies like that and I can handle it. And I realize that a movie can be that and also be good and also be well made. This was not the case. This was like, I don't even want to say like shock value for the sake of shock value because like that too you know like I wrote my thesis paper on um, slasher movies like I've seen a lot of like kind of trash and sleaze for the sake of just like eliciting shock in the viewer and I don't even think that's necessarily a problem it was like the way that this film seemed to think that it was being so like clever and cool and interesting and funny. The characters are like constantly kind of laughing at themselves and their own jokes, which just becomes so grating. Oh my God, the characters are like screaming all the time, like screaming, like for fun, like because they're so quirky and crazy. And <laughs> the movie as a result is very loud. It's just so loud. And just by the end of it, I was like, oh my God, I it was like hurting my brain to watch. And when I say it's like nasty and gross, what I mean is like, I don't know, there's like a recurring motif of like characters like spitting on each other and like drinking each other's spit. <laughs> and again, it's like I can deal with a movie being kind of gross on purpose. Um, but this felt like none of it felt intentional. None of it felt like well placed and purposeful. 
it, it, everything dragged on for too long, even in the opening of the film, which was my favorite part, the section with the mother and daughter, um, even there, it would be like multiple sequences back to back of the mother and daughter just having kind of a quirky, nice moment together. And they would just stack those on top of each other in such a way that you're like, okay, like the editor should have taken out at least like two or three of these. And the whole movie is like that. Like it needed a lot of editing, both at the script stage and like in the actual cut, I would say. There was like thread after thread that was just completely dropped. Um, the dynamics between the characters were just completely like half formed and, and half baked. The Joseph Quinn character is extremely confusing. Like what his ultimate purpose in the story is or what they were trying to say with that character totally lost on me. Like I cannot stress enough how spiteful I felt to this film by the end of it. It was to the point that when the movie ended, I actually turned to the man next to me who was a guy I'd never met. I turned to him and I said, did you enjoy that? And he was like, yeah. <laughs> What's really funny is, you know, this actor, Joseph Quinn, uh, and I only know this because I'm like terminally online, but Joseph Quinn has like quite a big kind of fan base, stan base, uh, because of his like Stranger Things role. I saw people on the internet, like young stan girls, being like really excited to see this new movie, Horde, because it has their boy, Joseph Quinn, in it. So let me say this as a warning to any of you out there. If you're like a steady shipper or a, a you know, what's his name, Joseph Quinn stan who wants to see this movie just because Joseph Quinn is in it, to heed my warning, do not go. He's been in other stuff. You can just watch that. Just watch that. Don't watch this. Nobody should watch this. If anything, that movie, The Sweet East, kind of feels like it succeeds at some of these like idiosyncratic young person quirky experiences that Horde was kind of going for. Like I, if you're going to watch Horde, which I hope you don't, I would recommend watching The Sweet East and Horde and kind of seeing, you know, they're different, different tones, I would say, but seeing the difference between the way those two films do like really wacky, dark humor because I, I think the the disparity is really clear. Anyway, horde, more like bored. Gotcha. All right, next up, let's talk about Ferrari. Now, as bad as Ferrari was, I have to admit some of my distaste for it is probably based just on the context that I saw it in. So let me explain. The BFI London Film Festival does this thing every year where they do something called the surprise film, which is what it sounds like. They, they sell tickets for a film at the Royal Festival Hall and they don't tell you what it is until you're there seated for it. And they've done some really exciting films as surprise films. Last year, it was The Menu. They've done like Anomalisa, um, Come On, Come On. I think they did School of Rock as a surprise film. Every once in a while, there's kind of a more boring film. Like, you know, I think they did Sully, they did Green Book. But like, usually, I feel like kind of the goal of the surprise film is it's something maybe a little bit different and a little bit out there. So we were very excited to get tickets. It's a very hot ticket. And we had had a few predictions for it. So our first guess was the movie Dream Scenario. We thought maybe it would be that. And our other one was, I forget what it's called, but what's that, that wrestling movie with Zac Efron that's coming out? We thought maybe it would be that. But anyway, either way, our expectations were like a little bit high. We were really hoping for these like A24 movies. So imagine our disappointment when the festival programmer comes out and she says, this was unhinged the way she introduced him. She said, let me introduce one of cinema's like most iconic figures. I swear, she said something along those lines, like cinema's most iconic people, Michael Mann. To describe this person as one of the most iconic people in cinema is just a sad understatement. Now, I don't want to be mean, <laughs> but there, there are some people I would describe as, as one of cinema's most iconic figures. Michael Mann is not one of them. So uh, hurrah, everyone. Michael Mann is here, a critically acclaimed director of Black Hat. I had heard of Ferrari. Um, so at least there's that. Like, my biggest fear was that they would announce the surprise film and I would have no idea what it was. Kind of like when, you know, my biggest fear for the Eras tour was that I would go and Taylor would play a song for the surprise song that I didn't, I didn't know. Which, l let me continue that metaphor. I feel like bringing Michael Mann's Ferrari, uh, out as the BFI London Film Festival surprise film is like if Taylor Swift did, like, 
me as her surprise song, you know? One of these things is not like the others. Like I said, I had heard of Ferrari, but not much. I knew that it starred Adam Driver. I had heard that it was about like that big racing crash that happened, but I honestly couldn't remember if it was about that crash or if I had heard that it wasn't. So I was kind of like not sure if that would be coming the whole film. Anyway, we're like, eh, okay, it's not what we wanted, but maybe it'll be good. But yeah, Ferrari was quite bad. I, for most of it, I was like, you know, maybe it's just because I'm disappointed it wasn't something else. And, you know, I'm tired. It was pretty late at night. The film didn't start till around nine. But then, no, as it went on, and especially after I got a chance to talk to my friend about it, I was like, no, I think this was like genuinely terrible. Part of it is that like on a technical level, it genuinely feels like a rough cut. It's like my, my friend who I was with is an editor and she was like really appalled. Um, a lot of scenes just like fade to black and that's it, which like isn't, you know, you can do that sometimes, but like for every scene, it, it feels kind of lazy. It often feels like, like you're cutting to commercial, you know? The score was edited in really bizarrely. That's what for me really made it feel like unfinished. The score would just randomly come in, like someone would be in the middle of this of a sentence and the score would come in, like not in a way that felt intentional. The CGI was pretty awful throughout. I noticed what looked like a lot of like digital zooms, which kind of took me out of it, just looked very ugly. This movie is set in Italy, right? And most of the characters are supposed to be Italian. And of course it's doing that thing where um, it just is people speaking English in Italian accents. Adam Driver is like pretty consistent throughout, but oh boy, there are some people who are sounding really rough in this movie. Probably the roughest is Shailene Woodley, who plays Adam Driver's like mistress. In her first couple scenes, I was like, okay, she has an Italian accent. Then she comes into a scene later where she fully sounds American, like occasional little Italian twang here and there. That was really bizarre. And then Patrick Dempsey is also in this movie, which at first I was excited about. He kind of like made me sit up in my seat. I'm like, finally, an actor that I like. Um, but he was also doing like the American... Italian accent. In his first scene, I actually thought he was just playing an American character, but then in a later scene, I'm like, oh no, he's like trying very slightly to sound Italian. So that was really strange. Like at that point, if none of your actors can do an Italian accent, I I'd much prefer if they just had had them talk in their natural accents. Like in films like that, I'm always like, well, you're already suspending our disbelief to the point where everyone is speaking English with each other. So it wouldn't be that big of a stretch to just not give them the Italian accents. The tone is all over the place. Like half of it is kind of like a soapy marriage drama. And then the other half is like very kind of rapid paced, like cool boy race car driving scenes. I did not find it very engaging at all, like any of it. And then it, it turns out this movie is about that crash. I forget what it's called, but there is a really famous deadly um, race car crash during like an open road race where a guy like his car spun out of control and like hit a bunch of onlookers. So it was like a really nasty, deadly crash. And this movie does include that, uh, <laughs> but it, it comes like in, it must be like the last like fifth of the movie, like very late in the film. And again, the tonal dissonance, like none of the rest of the film has been like this. Suddenly this crash happens like out of nowhere and it's like so like ghastly and bloody and horrible that, I mean, in fairness, it was like the first thing in the movie that made me like sit up and really like got my attention back. But also it's like, this movie has not earned a moment like this in any way. And then there are like no consequences for it. Like that happens and, and it, it's like nothing happens as a result of that. You see like, you know, Adam Driver in like one press conference and then the movie just kind of moves on. It's like, oh my God, who made this? This film is being distributed by Neon, by the way. It was actually on the list of um, films that got an interim agreement from SAG, uh, which both of those facts just kind of stupefy me. Like if there was ever a studio movie, you know, this feels like one. I would not recommend Ferrari, but it was kind of funny being in this audience of people who were also extremely disappointed by the surprise film being Ferrari. All right, finally, uh, grand finale, my last worst film <laughs> was the movie Maestro of Bradley Cooper fame. So Maestro is a biopic of composer and conductor Leonard Bernstein, 
uh, directed by and starring Bradley Cooper. The film actually mostly follows Bernstein's marriage uh, more than his career, but it, it spans basically from the time he was like a 25-year-old when he met his wife to uh, almost the time he died when he was much older. Now, in fairness, I feel like I did go into this one kind of biased because I did not really like Bradley Cooper's first uh, directorial venture, A Star is Born. I know a lot of people did, and I thought there was like some promising filmmaking there, but I just found it like a really disturbing story that they had not really updated for modern times. And what really disturbed me was the fact that the film seemed like totally unaware of the fact that it was a disturbing story, which, you know, to me kind of pointed to not a very self-aware filmmaker, right? The elephant in this room is the giant prosthetic nose that they put on Bradley Cooper uh, for some reason. Of course, Bernstein was a famous Jewish artist. Uh, Bradley Cooper is a famous non-Jewish non-artist. <laughs> that was me, no? That was too much, I'm sorry. No, Bradley Cooper is not Jewish, um, so, you know, that already sparked a little bit of just questions, and then when people saw the trailer and saw that the makeup artist had mind-blowingly put this giant prosthetic nose on him, you know, it was like, did nobody consider the implications of putting a big fake nose on a, on a Jewish character? I wouldn't say this distracted me as much as I thought it would, to be honest. I will say Bradley Cooper's face in general terrifies me. He has like those crazy eyes and um, you know, the crazy eyes combined with the giant fake nose, he just scared me. There are multiple sequences in this film where we see Bernstein conducting and um, for some reason Cooper has decided to, you know, direct these scenes in such a way, I mean, I think Bernstein was known for being like a very passionate conductor, um, but Cooper has decided to, for one thing, have a lot of extreme close-ups on his scary face. And also, you know, he's really going for it. You know, he is acting, acting. He has his huge, crazy eyes open extremely wide. He's like dripping with sweat. He's so sweaty. He's smiling this crazed grin and he has his scary nose. I swear, during these sequences, I was afraid that he was going to like jump out of the screen and kill me. And you know, it's one of those situations where like you look at pictures of the real Bernstein and he just looks like a normal guy, right? Just normal, normal looking guy. And then you look at the pictures of Bradley Cooper or like these scenes of him conducting and he looks like the fucking green goblin. But me being scared of Bradley Cooper's face was not my only problem with the movie. I actually did not really like on the whole that this marriage chose, I mean, this movie <laughs> chose to focus on the marriage, um, mostly just because I I'm not saying there's nothing interesting about it, but it's like, it makes it feel like the story did not have to be about Leonard Bernstein. I assume the main reason they decided to do that is um, Bernstein was gay and also married to a woman. And so there's like an interesting dynamic there, right? Like, do they love each other? Are they in love with each other? You know, how does she feel about all this? How does he feel about it? But that's not a story that's unique to Leonard Bernstein. Like you could have just made a period piece about that if, if you wanted Bradley Cooper. Also like, again, not to be mean, but I would not have chosen Bradley Cooper to play this gay man. Bradley Cooper is probably one of the most like aggressively heterosexual seeming men on this earth. Like, I'm sorry, but he was just not selling it. I, I never believed him. That's the whole thing about his performance, even beyond the prosthetics and even beyond his scary eyes and stuff. I, I just, he, he's probably doing a pretty convincing like impression of Bernstein but he just never feels fully convincing. It's it's a very common problem in these really over the top biopics where they're trying so hard to like perfectly recreate that character where like it doesn't feel natural. It, it doesn't feel like they're actually like inhabiting that person. It feels like they're just kind of doing an impression or, or putting on the costume. That being said, Carrie Mulligan as Bernstein's wife like totally steals the movie. She's much better than Bradley Cooper. And that leads me to the next problem, which is uh, the writing. <laughs> I like, I guess structurally it's fine, but let me tell you, I hated the style of dialogue in this movie. It's all like constant, like really fast talking, quippy dialogue. That's what this movie is founded on. It's sort of like, like Sorkin-esque, like wannabe Sorkin. That's kind of the only, I'm kind of, I'm going through a phase where I'm kind of like, you know that meme about the guy who's like only seen the boss baby watching any other movie and being like, I'm getting real boss baby vibes from this. That's how I am right now with the movie, The Social Network. 
So I'll watch like literally anything else. And I'm like, hmm, I feel like this guy's trying to be Sorkin. But no, I genuinely like whatever. Sorkin originated this style of dialogue, right? For the most part, I feel like this, I feel like this thought it was like as clever and as good as Sorkin, it was not. And like, say what you want about that style. But like, at least like in a Sorkin movie, you know, it's not constant. It's like there are ups and downs to it. And of course, the dialogue is like actually intelligent and good. And, and he's so good at like getting information across in that way, right? That was not the case with this. For one thing, I'm sorry to say, part of it was that like half of the dialogue was like genuinely unintelligible to me, at least. Bradley Cooper has like a cigarette hanging out of his mouth for half of his lines, which is clearly like an intentional character thing, but it made it so that you can't hear a damn thing that the man says. So part of it was that I like, I could, I needed subtitles. I genuinely couldn't understand half of the dialogue, but the stuff that I could understand, it, it's just going so fast. Half of it is like, like kind of not very good jokes that the characters think are like really funny. And that kind of makes it a lot more annoying to watch. Like half of this movie is just like Carrie Mulligan laughing at Bradley Cooper making jokes, which kind of doesn't help the the movie feeling narcissistic, you know? Oh, that's uh, 12. No. <laughs> 20. No. <laughs> I'm thinking of a number. <laughs> No, you have to think. <laughs> I'm, trying. I'm trying to. It really felt like a couple of writers trying very hard to write clever dialogue and, and just not actually having the cleverness to back it up. At the beginning of the film, you know, Bradley Cooper wasn't there, but several of the cast and crew were. The producer was there, the, <laughs> the infamous makeup artist was there, the costume designer, I think, a couple other people. And the producer, first of all, this was extremely funny. She introduced, she, she called Bradley Cooper one of the greatest living actors. And I'm like, you know, he's he's a fine actor, but like, damn, that's that's a very bold thing to say, in my opinion. So that was very funny. But she also said this thing about um, how Bradley Cooper, he really didn't want to make a conventional biopic. He wanted to make an unconventional biopic. He didn't want to make a traditional biopic. He actually said, I'm going to make a story about love and marriage and family. And that's my story you guys are going to see tonight. And now having watched the movie, it's like, you know, I'm sorry, Brad, but what you made is a conventional biopic. It's a very conventional biopic that feels dressed up in a lot of layers of people wanting to make an unconventional biopic and wanting to appear very clever and, and different and naturalistic and cinematic, but it is none of those things. And even when it kind of tries to aim for those things... I, it just feels like unintentional, not purposeful, kind of just like the people behind it don't really know what they're doing. There's something that strikes me as very try hard about Bradley Cooper's style, both his direction and his acting, where, I mean, like I've said, it's like it never feels like it comes naturally to him. It just feels like he's sort of trying to imitate the work of, of better films, the better people that he's seen. So yes, I really didn't like Maestro, but um, a lot of people did. You know, I, I met up with some friends after that I had met at the festival and they really liked it. So I don't know, it's like, maybe you should give it a shot if you, if you think you might like it, but I, it was really not for me. And that is it for the worst uh, and the best. That's about all that I really found notable and wanted to talk about. I definitely saw several other films, but uh, didn't have as strong of feelings about them. I did review some films on Letterboxd, so if you want a little more of my opinions, you can check that out. But uh, I often don't really do detailed reviews on Letterboxd, and I often don't even really do numerical reviews on there, because it's not my favorite system of, of rating films. But I do heart it if I really liked it. So there's that. I'll be back in America soon. I'm not sure what I'll do next. I've been thinking maybe because this was my October video, I might do like a belated Halloween video next month, but we'll see. Let me know what film festival I should go to next. Subscribe to the channel. See you next time. Bradley Cooper, please don't jump out of the screen and kill me.